Uh, let me introduce uh, our, uh, our other panelists before uh, we uh, launch the conversation. Uh, first is Diane Jacovella, who is the um, Vice President of Multilateral and Global Programs at CEDA, who has responsibility for uh, CEDA's institutional relationships and programs with um, large multilateral institutions, uh, also has thematic responsibilities for CEDA's programming in food and nutrition and maternal child health, etc. So, Deanne, welcome. We have Lynette Newfeld, who is the Director of Technical Services uh, at the uh, Micronutrient Initiative, uh, and Howdy Buis with uh, Harvest Plus, uh, which is a very interesting uh, uh, program uh, that we'll learn a bit more about in a few minutes. Uh, welcome all, and thank you for agreeing to, uh, to participate. Bob, thank you for your remarks. Uh, you've laid out uh, the moral case for doing this. You've laid out the research base upon which we're working on it. Heck, even the economists agree. It's hard um, to imagine, isn't it? <laughs> it really, well, I mean, it seems to be one of those issues um, uh, which has a very unique, maybe entirely unique, confluence of um, uh, stakeholders and thinking processes behind it. Why is this still an issue? Important question. Um, you know, nutrition has been seen as a rather difficult problem to tackle. And I, I think not so long ago, um, even four years ago, when we reviewed the world situation, one could say that there was a rather fragmented approach to addressing um, nutrition, especially maternal and child nutrition. And, and I think what's happened in the last four years, for a variety of reasons, is much more coalescence around mm -hmm. uh, a commitment to address um, uh, child nutrition, let's say, or maternal and child nutrition, and organizational coordination and uh, agency commitment mm -hmm. that is, I think, is different now. Uh, I think in the past that was not there. And, and I would say one other thing. Uh, there, there is a, a great deal of effort and investment going on in regard to agriculture and producing additional crops and calories for the world. And that's obviously important, you know, important to meet the need now and meet the need of a growing population. But I think in, um, in, until recently there was not enough discussion on the nutrition aspects related mm -hmm. to agriculture to be sure that the enhancements of uh, crop productivity really helped meet nutritional needs, mm -hmm. that, that income that was perhaps generated by these crops could be appropriately used and, and um, in the hands of the families that needed, mm -hmm. needed that. And so, uh, you know, I think the, um, th the world is changing and I think now there's, to me, a much greater commitment to see the problem Solved. Yeah. I mean, Bob, was this just an issue of the nutrition people not talking to the agriculture? Was, it, was this just an issue yes. of knowledge <laughs> silos in, in or, programmatic, <laughs> or programmatic yeah. silos? Right. Uh, so, you know, I, I think what, what we've all seen is that, you know, there has been a, a great deal of emphasis on particular diseases, you know, HIV, AIDS, yes. even, you know, historically diarrhea as, as a disease. These so-called vertical um, programs. These vertical programs, exactly. And, and, you know, with those, and, and some of those vertical programs made a difference, there's no question. But, you know, nutrition sort of got lost in the process because it's, you know, it, it, other than in an emergency setting, it's not seen so much as a disease. It's not seen as with certain urgency right. to deal with. And, and I, I think the, uh, you know, recognition that this was really such an underlying problem for many of the deaths, many of the, you know, causes of severe disease, right. um, was just not there. It was not, it was not appreciated, the, the, um, the, the magnitude of it or the consequences. And as I said, some of the micronutrients were hardly appreciated at all as, right. a pro as part of that problem. Bob, um, it seems to me that the whole question of what and how much people eat is a tough question, even in this part of the world. Sure. Um, um, yes. Right. And it implicates a lot more than just knowing. Um, uh, presumably, people have to think about uh, uh, changing a lot of their uh, of their practices. How much of uh, of the challenge here is uh, not just getting the knowledge base right, not just getting the donors and institutions aligned, but actually trying to figure out what it takes from a public health perspective mm -hmm. to get people to change what they have typically done? 
Well, certainly um, changing behaviors, especially deeply uh, ingrained behaviors, cultural behaviors, such as how to feed children, is, is not simple. But you know, I think if you look at the, um, at the economic development of countries, as, uh, as, as families have more income, they do improve their diet. So there, there is a major element of poverty. They're, they don't have the option to have a diverse diet. They don't have the option to you know, have animal source protein uh, with the micronutrients involved in their diet because they're poor. And so you know, it's, it is a, a behavioral issue, but it's also a poverty issue. Right. And I think solving the poverty issue and also providing the right nutrients you know, in, the, in that environment, I think is there, that's part of the solution. Dion, um, uh, Canada actually has been a leader on this for some time, uh, not kind of jumping on the bandwagon recently. I mean, the MI is an institution that is um, many, many years old. Um, how are you seeing CETA's priorities today in, um, in the whole area of, uh, of nutrition? Um, maybe just even before talking about priorities, I just want right. to emphasize what you said. I think we've seen from a long time that we, we needed to look at direct intervention on what's happening now, but also looking in the long term uh, where the difference will be. And this morning we were talking with Haldi and we we're saying, well, the results we're having today are actually funding you gave us 10 years, Ten ago. years ago. So right. I, I think it shows the importance of having also a long term approach to some of And to sustaining things. that investment and over sustaining time. Yeah, this right. investment. Um, I, I'm just thinking back in 2010 when the scaling up nutrition movement actually started. This is so-called, we call the sun. sun. Yeah, the right. Sun. Um, we were there from the beginning in terms of working with the World Bank and some other countries to, MI was part of this as well, you know, developing the framework of what it is. And we've been there also in terms of launching the movement. And, you know, you were saying there wasn't any attention, and you're right. Like, people were not paying attention mm -hmm. to this because... Some people were seeing it as a health issue, so oh, the health people will worry about it, or no, it's an agriculture issue, the agriculture people can look about it, can worry about it. I think what we realize is that we all need to look at it if we want to make a difference. So I think for me the priorities is, uh, maybe I'll outline four quickly. One is I think we need to continue to invest in direct intervention. We know, like Bob just said, we know what works, we know a small investment can have significant impact, we need to continue doing it. And a direct intervention for you is Vit fortifying something. Vitamin A, right. uh, the zinc that we're talking about right. with oral uh, rehydration salts. So those, those kinds of things that, that we're doing, we need to continue doing right. them. Um, but we also need to look at what we call nutrition uh, sensitive interventions. Uh, and this is the money we give to agriculture. Can we make sure that it's not just we're not just raising the yield, we're also raising, I would say, three things. The yield, the income of people so they mm -hmm. can spend money elsewhere, and the third one, the nutritional impact. So it's kind of putting a nutrition lens on the yes. agricultural investments as well. Mm -hmm. but, yes, but we need to be careful that we just don't take it for granted that if we say it's gonna ha we'll do it, it's going to happen. Right. So we need also to build the evidence right. that if you do it a certain way, it will actually have a nutritional impact. Okay. And there's not a lot of organization, there's a lot of organization now that say, that try to include nutrition consideration, but that measure it. And I think that's one of the things that Harvest Plus is doing, is that making sure that they're going to measure to see at the end, are we actually having a nutritional impact? Right. The third one I would say is uh, we need to build different partnership, different relationship. And we need to bring all the stakeholders, and that includes the private sector. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there may be some, some sensitivities. There was always no in yes. terms of the issue of breast milk and those right. kinds of things. And, um, but, but there's ways of bringing the private sector, and we need to work with them uh, for them to bring the know-how, the expertise they have, uh, all, all the, the production, the value chain aspect. You know, so if, if uh, Harvest Plus finds great uh, seeds, but there's no one to take it on, then it won't work. So we, we need to look at our partnership, and I think we need to use all the platforms that we have to make sure that the nutrition message is right. there. And the fourth thing quickly is, I think, accountability. Uh, for Canada, accountability is a premium, and I think we, we are recognized internationally for uh, paying what we pledge. And we've shown that at the G8, that you know, don't come with, with big announcement, make mm -hmm. sure the money is there and delivered. So pay what you pledge, and also accountability on results. And the work, you, you were on the, uh, the commission that was 
co-chaired by our prime minister when you know uh, uh, we identified a specific goal for maternal, newborn, and child health and indicators. So we all work towards the same outcomes, right. and we measure what we do. And is CETA going to be working across all these priorities um, that you've outlined, these four priorities? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, Lynette, uh, we see the MI as kind of uh, 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 an elemental institution in the, uh, in the nutrition landscape globally. Obviously, uh, 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 great affection for it as a Canadian uh, institution. Tell us a bit about how um, MI fits into some of the issues that have been raised so far, where does it fit into the portfolio of institutions that are doing work today in this area? Okay, um, MI, I think we could call the leader yeah. in uh, promoting and uh, implementing with the support of CEDA for the last 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the two major interventions, well, the, the one major intervention right. that was mentioned um, by Bob in terms of vitamin A supplementation, right, uh, right from ensuring that the policies are in place yes. and supporting governments in the development of those policies right. to ensure the programs are implemented through the procurement and distribution issues that are vital. You can't have a program if you have no product. Right. But also ensuring that the structures and the delivery systems are, are there and those contact points with the population are right. happening with the partner organizations that are on the ground and implementing programs in the country. Right. So if you take a step back from that one, that's what we call our strategic objective related to child survival. Right. It's a key intervention to ensure that children survive. Right. Now, more recently, we've also added the, the, with the same, with the same lens, working through from policy all the way through delivery and again getting the delivery and the, and the utilization of that in the population for the zinc um, for treatment of ORS. Right. So those two are really our portfolio of programs related to child survival. But if you think of an analogy of development, it's important that you, it's like alleviating poverty, right? right? You, ha you want to make sure that it's immediate, the immediate need is dealt with. Right. But that's not the only thing. The only reason those programs are needed is because children are deficient and women are deficient. Right. If they weren't deficient, we would not need those programs. Children would survive. So they said they're deficient in vitamin A and vitamin zinc before a, you even get to them. Absolutely. Right. And their mothers are deficient. Their mothers were deficient as children and therefore they didn't grow as they should, right. so the babies are small and they don't have the reserves that they needed. Right. And those women, their women, their right. mothers were deficient and so it becomes ultimately an intergenerational problem. Right. So upstream of the deficiency that you're dealing with, right. you're trying to understand what are the chains uh, of, of issues right. before then. We know that. Right. We know that. The problem with that one is it's not an easy sell. You know, what are you trying to sell there? When you're trying to sell child survival, we're going to save millions of lives. Right. That's an easy sell for right. CETA to donor. take to the people who, they, who have the budget in hand. Right. Some of the other areas where we're working on, which is child growth, child development, right. the fact that we do these interventions and those children are going to be taller. Right. Who cares? Who needs taller kids? Who needs taller kids? Yeah. You're going to have to change the buses because right. buses yeah. are small. <laughs> Why do we care that children are taller? Right. You know? I care that children are taller because I know that a child who hasn't grown to their genetic potential also doesn't have the same potential to survive. To, to survive. Right. They also die easily. Right. It's, not the, it's not that immediate need, right. but it is still there. Right. Their immune system is still compromised. Right. Their development is compromised. When right. they get to school, they will not be able to have the same achievement in that school as a child who has reached their growth potential because in parallel with impeding their growth, their mental development is impeded. Right. And when that child who has had that impediment, in, the impediment from young age is also physically, in, in, uh, has a physical impediment to reach their full work capacity. Right. But Linda, what do the actual interventions look like upstream? So I mean, I think it's very clear to us now what supplementation looks like in the right. face of an actual deficiency. Right. What do we know about what works upstream of that? We know a lot. We have a lot of evidence. We know that, we know that breastfeeding up to six months of age right. is vital. Right. Well, exclusive up to six months right. of age, up to hopefully up to two years of age, right. um, complemented by other things. We know that if the quality of the food that children receive between six and 24 months of age is adequate, as in it has enough not only energy, essential fats and protein, but also the vitamins and minerals, that that child will grow to their potential. And we know that. And we know many things about how to get that, those nutrients to the children. Mm. 
what do we give our kids? Right. Do you just give them a little bit of that soup that you're having? Right. To your six-year-old? How many people to their six-month-old, sorry, <laughs> give the same thing that you're eating? Do you take a few spoonfuls out of your plate and give it to that child? No, you don't. You give them baby food. Why do you give them baby food? Because they need a different texture, they need a different consistency, and most importantly, they need a different nutrient density. Mm. And we know how to get that nutrient density up. Industry has got it perfected. Mm. The problem is that in many countries around the world, in many populations, those foods aren't accessible or they're not affordable. We also know ways that we can increase the quality of that food by other interventions that are easy to deliver. We have micronutrient powders that a woman can take that portion of food, she can add it in, it is one gram, it does no taste, it has no color, it has no, it has no flavor, and she can improve the nutritional quality of that food she's going to give her child by a very, very simple technology. Right. Right? And we know it works. We have evidence from all over the world that it works. And we also have evidence that women accept it and use it when they're provided with it. Right. We also know that if you germinate foods and you ferment foods and you change your processing methodologies, right. the nutrient quality increases. Right. It's not a lack of evidence. Right. It's a lack of delivery and it's a lack of, of, these are not easy interventions. These are not get the tablet out there. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not the model of the magic bullet. Right. It's complicated. It's very complicated. It requires a lot of behavior change both on the part of, of um, all the way from industry, all the way through healthcare providers, right. all the way obviously to the home and how foods are distributed within the home and how foods are prepared and provided to children. Right. In most rural agricultural countries, women, women have many responsibilities. They're working in the field, they're right. caring for children, they're, caring, they're preparing food for the husband. All of those things have to happen at the same time they're giving food to the children. Who has time to make that special pap and all those right. things that you know I did as a mother and probably all of the mothers in the room did. Right. But we have the luxury of doing that. So we have to find viable, feasible, both economically and practical, practically feasible solutions. Right. And then we have to get them to scale. And we have to get the, the commitment, just like we have that long-term commitment for those, those that that the poverty alleviation analogy side right. of nutrition, we need commitment and long-term commitment for the, let's call it the, the social protection for the, for the economic development side of nutrition, right. you know, using that same analogy. This right. is the long-term commitment. This is building the schools and investing for new jobs. That's that side of development. Right. That's what we need to do. And that's where globally it has not been as easy to get the long-term commitment, and I understand why. Right. You can't take that and sell it to the politician as, I'm going to save 100,000 lives. It's, it's not an easy sell, but we have to find a way to do that, and, and MI is committed to doing that. Right. We have some programs, and we also work a lot on the research that's needed, but not those randomized control trials. We know what to do. What we need to know is how to do it. Well, uh, Andrew Howdy uh, uh, Andrew here. Uh, um, uh, in some senses, you're trying to eliminate the need for us to do anything further on this, uh, it seems to me. Um, it's out of business. Uh, uh, you want to put this whole group out of business. Yeah. Uh, That's good. Uh, uh, I'm ready. Uh, power to you, Howdy. Um, this is often called a hidden uh, disease, and you're trying to find a hidden solution. Uh, tell us a bit about what Harvest uh, Plus is trying to do vis-a-vis -vis the issues, especially this last issue that Lynette has talked about. Yeah. Um, yeah, what, uh, what Harvest Plus is trying to do is get the plant breeders to not only breed for higher yields, um, disease resistance, pest resistance, but at the same time to put more minerals and vitamins in the staple food crops that the poor eat in large quantities. Um, why do we want to approach things that way? Well, I'm, I'm an economist by training. Uh -oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what's always appealed to me about agriculture research is the multiplier effects. So you can spend money, do research in a central location, and you develop a new seed, a new technology. Then you can make that seed available to country after country. And once that seed is in the, in the food system, it's available to consumers year after year after year. 
So you spend the money up front and you don't have the recurrent costs. Is this, is this creating superfoods? Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's creating superfoods. I'd also take issue with you that I'm trying to put uh, others <laughs> out of business. Everyone out of business is fine. Um, it's just, it's one, way, it's one way that agriculture can be used to improve iron intakes, right. zinc intakes, vitamin A intakes in a very cost-effective way. So we're shifting the distribution, the intake distribution. We're doing something where we invest a dollar, we get high return, and we're helping to solve the problem. Mm. But we're not solving the whole problem. The, the ultimate solution is for people's incomes to go up, for people to be able to afford the diverse diets that we're able to afford. Uh, but it takes decades to increase incomes to the level where people can afford the diets that are really required. And, and biofortification is just something that can be done along the way to help reduce mineral and vitamin deficiencies. So give us an example, Howdy, of, of one of the crops that you would try to biofortify. What, what, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Okay, so um, orange maize. Africans, Africans eat white maize. Vitamin A deficiency is a huge problem in Africa. Uh, white maize has no vitamin A. Uh, we're putting in uh, 15 micrograms per gram into the, into the maize. It turns it to an orange color. And at the levels that Africans consume white maize, if they'll just switch over to the orange maize, that will provide 50% of the estimated average requirement. Hmm. So it, doesn't, it isn't the whole requirement, but they're already getting some vitamin A from the foods they're already eating. And we're adding another 50% on top of that. Now, how are you selecting which crops you're going to focus on? Well, in the first instance, you select the most widely eaten crops. So rice, wheat, maize, cassava, those are the four most widely eaten. You also look for where the science is easy. And so we found with uh, beans and with pearl millet, we're able to increase the iron content relatively easy from a scientific perspective. And they're also many millions of consumers who eat beans and pearl millet. Mm. And then, of course, uh, you may have heard about orange sweet potato. Africans eat white sweet potato. The orange sweet potato was already available here in Latin America, uh, in uh, North America. All we had to do was bring that to Africa, adapt it to the growing conditions in Africa. It was already very high. Uh, sweet potato, orange sweet potato, is one of the foods with the most dense levels of provitamin A in any food. And what's been your actual experience at trying to get some of these crops in wide cultivation? Um, uh, I'll, before I address that, sure. I'll back up a little bit and I'll say the, one of the barriers to this approach was 10 years ago. Right. We had to go to the donors and we had to say, this is really cost effective. This is really going to be great. We're going to have a large impact. But you're going to have to give us a lot of money for 10 years <laughs> before, we, before we have any impact. And that, and that was a difficult sell. And CETA was one of, the, one of the institutions, one of the donors. CETA is our second largest donor that, that believed in the strategy and invested in the strategy. Now, we had the orange sweet potato available four years ago. And, but now, in the last 10 months, um, uh, Provitamin A cassava was released in Nigeria last December. Just to show you how long this takes, we had that we had those varieties two years ago, and we knew they were high yielding and they are high in nutrients. But you can't release a variety unless the varietal release committee tests it for two years and confirms that it meets agronomic standards. So now we have that permission, that release, right. and farmers are now growing high pro vitamin A cassava in Nigeria. High iron beans were released in Rwanda in June. High iron pearl millet was sold for the first time in India in June. And in the next two weeks, the Zambian authorities will release the high pro vitamin A maize, and they'll be grown for the first time in November in Zambia. Hmm. So that's kind of where we are. Now, we had the orange sweet potato. Right. We got funding to do pilot dissemination of the orange sweet potato in Uganda and Mozambique. 24,000 target households. We also studied it very carefully. We had control villages, intervention villages. Sixty-two thirds of the households adopted the orange sweet potato. Those households converted about half of their white sweet potato to orange sweet potato. 
Vitamin A intakes increased anywhere from 60% to 100% among the preschool children and the adult women. And we took blood samples in Uganda and we found that the serum retinol improves because of those improved vitamin A intakes. So we found that when households, the, especially the mothers, we're given the information, if you, if you will grow this orange sweet potato, you'll protect your children from vitamin A deficiency if you switch from the white to the orange and consume the orange. When they had that information, they switched and all these good things happened. Hmm. Now the issue is how to get that information. I'm an economist. Right. How do you get that information at low cost? Yeah, and right. that's, that's what we're working out. We can go door to door and give them that information. That's very expensive. You can't scale up if you do it that way. You can put it on radio, but you don't have face-to-face -face contact. And radio messages are cheap, but they don't change behavior. So we're working, for example, through NGO networks. They have, they have their farmer networks. They have their regular meetings. They have the face-to-face -face contact. They have the trust. So we're getting the NGOs to take on the biofortified crops in their programs and to talk and to give the households this information. So, so far it's worked with Thorn Sweet Potato and we're just starting with the other varieties. Right. We're uh, gonna be open for questions. So, uh, do we have roving mics? We've got uh, a couple uh, at the back. So just wave your hand or, I don't know, make a funny sound and someone will come running uh, <laughs> to you. Um, before we take the first one, Bob. Uh, so you've heard uh, everyone here. Um, it seems that uh, there's been some change in the last several years, uh, a critical mass of um, knowledge and focus and institutional commitment. Does it feel different than it did 10 years ago? It certainly does. I think the, the scaling up nutrition yeah. movement was, was mentioned. I think that is, that is a major development, more than 100 organizations with strong leadership from Canada, actually. And I think that's, that's entirely new. Mm -hmm. uh, we, did, we wouldn't have seen that before. You know, there are other related uh, you know, initiatives and movements that I think you know, are, are very related to Sun, but also have uh, some energy, the Thousand Days uh, movement, which really does focus on that pregnancy in first two right. years, which is part of Sun, as I say, but it's also had uh, a, sort of a separate uh, launch and, and uh, attention. So, you know, I think there, I think there really is um, more coordination and more concerted action, you know, real commitment right. than I see now.